will not be reduced and may well increase. In addition, we're going to have the CDF also volatilizing PCBs into the air. Uh, so this proposal for this community is simply an unmitigated negative. There's, there's no good effect for this in terms of the environmental hazard. Um, we know as well um, that the CDF is going to have to withstand a lot of extreme weather events. Uh, you may remember uh, after Hurricane Sandy, uh, when the remnants of that came over here, we had uh, several days of very strong winds blowing out of the north. Uh, and that actually, that, that was so strong it pushed some sand to several <coughs> feet to the south. Uh, if you have winds like that in the CDF at the water levels they currently are, that's going to push, not only create a lot of wave action and aerosolization that was described, but it's also going to push the water levels very close to the top of the dike which will, will further increase the amount of spray that's going to be going you know, down into, onto uh, Central High School and onto the neighborhoods beyond. Um, and so, you know, once, that, once that's back out in the neighborhood, there's not really going to be any putting it back. You know, once, once that happens, there's not going to be much you can do about it. So that's what we know, and I'd like to also focus very quickly on what we don't know. Um, there's one, one of the early examples of environmental racism that was, became well known in this country was Emel, Alabama, where a very large chemical waste dump was sited in a black community. And the reason given was that uh, it sat on a 700 foot thick layer of impermeable chalk. So they said that waste can't get out in 10,000 years. Uh, it turned out uh, about five years later, the waste was starting to show up in people's wells. Uh, and so, you know, when, when we have these assurances from the Army Corps that this facility is built on an impermeable clay layer, uh, I, I think it's important to remember we've, we've heard that before. And however, without claiming any bad faith on anyone's part, that's just a promise that's going to be very unlikely to prove true. Um, so uh, for those reasons, our organization collaborated on the Community Coalition's written comments on March 30th, 2017. They were submitted to IBAN, <coughs> excuse me, UPA, IDEM, and the Army Corps. Uh, and we joined with the East Chicago Waterway Management District, the East Chicago City Council, and all the other fine organizations up here uh, in opposing the cost deferment for the CDF. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Vanessa Orange. Hi, I am a school city, school city Chicago trustee, and like I told Ms. Um, Reverend Rivera, I'm here, at one, just trying to gain knowledge for our school district in a sense because I know our school students obviously will get impacted immediately um, with the lead crisis that we had and seeing all of our students having to leave in Chicago. Our biggest task is trying to entice families or schools or children to stay in the city of East Chicago. Right. And um, one of the things that our superintendent, uh, her idea was to make um, a facility for preschool students uh, near the Central uh, Central High School, which now is going to move on site with the younger minds of the students of the city of East mm -hmm. Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as, as you start putting the toxins, as we saw in Calumet, region or the Calumet area, uh, do putting that into a student at a young age obviously is going to affect them now. Um, and that to me, to me and I, I speak for myself right now is obviously very concerning. Um, it's also by putting this out to the community, to different communities, that also does not allow students to want to come or families to want to come bring their students here. And our city, as I think school city and civil city, we want to bring uh, progress. I think we all feel that way. And the fact that um, we're trying to find a way to keep students out of our school city, it's um, very damaging. Um, I'm here, obviously, just trying to get some more information and take back to our uh, constituents just so we can make sure we know and gain knowledge and keep obviously that out. Um, I told Reverend Rivera it's also very dear because of the fact that I grew up two blocks down from Central High School. So this is obviously going to affect my parents who still own a home there, who um, plan on living there still. And as myself, I just purchased a home. I have two kids who are young, who I have a special needs kids also. And 
this is all going to affect them to a different level. And um, again, this is not something we want for our younger youth, who eventually will be the ones sitting here fighting against something else. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, Wanda Bordils, the president of Indiana LULAC. My name is Wanda Gordillo. I'm a lifelong resident of Chicago. I'm also the director of the state of Indiana for the League of Latin American Citizens and the national president of the Puerto Rican um, Women. National Puerto Rican Women. Okay. Um, I am also the chair of the Bottles um, Incident of Water here in East Chicago. For the, and I also belong to the Community Strategy Group. Today we have collected and distributed over 302,424 bottles in the Superfund and the Coaches Senior Building. We already have people who do trust the water to drink. Reverend Rivera and I and Echo Team have also worked with the school children in and after reading our school programs. Our children in East Chicago are running an average of two years behind in reading vocabulary and comprehension. Our Latino children and families are a great threat and assault from toxins and contamination, just like our African American children and families. Lulek 5024 and Lulek Indiana object to the toxic PCB next to our schools or anywhere in our community. We do not want and will not accept anything else poisoning our Latino families and our African American families. <laughs> Next, we will have Marta Frank. She's with the Rebel Bells, and she is a youth leader with the Community Strategy Group. She just came from just Washington, D.C. Washington, just D.C. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just from Washington. Um, we would like to welcome Washington, D.C. Um, we ask the legislators for environmental justice. Um, first, we went with Representative Mr. Strategy, who said, most time with us directly. Um, then we met with Senator Donnelly. Um, Donnelly's aide, Chase Kitchen, who spoke with us, well, Senator Donnelly, who's out of vote. Senator Donnelly may, made it to our meeting eventually. Both Senator Donnelly and Chase were very attentive. Finally, we met with Senator Todd Young's aide, Kent. Kent told us that Senator Young was actually having a phone call with a conversation with EPA at the exact same meeting. We asked all of our legislators to write a letter of opposition to task the permit that would allow higher levels of toxins in the CDF. We asked for East Chicago, as an environmental justice community, to have the best of care and the best of intentions wrapped around it in all policies. We talked about East Chicago as a sacrifice zone and asked for the end of policies that would end up with some people and some places being treated as if they don't matter. Mm -hmm. We made it clear we are not against the dredging of the Indiana Harbor Dredging Canal, but we want a dredging that is a full cleanup and not providing another hit to the community as a trade off for getting another one. We do not want a higher level of PCB permitted by the CDF. Four schools were just discovered to have high levels of PCB in East Chicago. We asked for higher care possible in the cleanup and the care of the place and people of the Superfund site, the Calumet Lead Crisis, and the Calumet Lead Crisis. Um, we provided each with a letter from the Community Strategy Group of East Chicago. Um, Rebel Bell's representatives have regularly attended CSG meetings. Um, it was a very empowering we thank our legislators for meeting with us and for Mom's Clear and Air for, for providing us with this opportunity. Thank you, Marta. <laughs> and, this, and this is why we are fighting to stop that permit, because we need youth leaders. They will be taking charge, and they need all of the brain cells and everything they can in order to make sure that our communities are clean. Thank you, Marta. Fantastic job. Next, George. Smoka, scientist. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Actually, my name is George Smoka. 
I um, not not to uh, break my arm patting myself on the back, but I have degrees in biology and two degrees in chemistry, which is why they want me here. Uh, one of the problems with this material, PCB, is it can be very easily converted to dioxin. I think everybody here remembers Love Canal by a simple oxidation step, which isn't all that simple, but I'm not going to go into all that. You can convert it to forms of things called dioxin-like materials. I don't think I have to tell you what the long-term effects of that is. Um, so that is the problem. This stuff is sitting around, has been sitting around for quite a while. A bit of it now is being exposed, I should say a large amount of it now, is being exposed to the air. With air present, the probability or the possibility of it converting to a dioxin-like material is unfortunately high. How high, I don't know. The, the studies on this site have not been done wide. Nobody wants to put the money in to do it. These things are rather expensive. Now there's a second problem that has already been alluded to. The fact that we have white caps and other things that will cause aerosols of the water in the CDF. I, as a chemist, worked with aerosols in one of my earlier lives, if you want to put it that way, when I was younger. And the problem with the aerosols is the following. These little droplets of water almost always contain small amounts of sand or some other particulate in there. In high temperatures of summer, they will dry down before they re-enter the water. So you have bits of dust flying around on the CDF. That dust will be wafted away by the wind and can end up anywhere. The other part of the problem is PCBs are not very soluble. They will glomp onto, latch onto anything they can. The solubility is so low that people don't really pay that much attention to it. But once that dries down, it will grab onto that piece of sand or piece of dirt and be part of the dust that is blown away. As it's blown into the community, it settles on everything. It settles on your sandwich. It settles on your, your morning cereal. And we're going to have a problem of constant recontamination and constant exposure to the people, at least in East Chicago, and who knows how far away. There have been sand particles found that <coughs> originated in the Sahara that eventually ended up on the east coast of the United States. How far is this stuff going to blow? How far in District 1 is this stuff going to blow? We've got a problem. We have 675,000 people in District 1 and about 29,000 people in East Chicago. Okay, now who is at risk? The, the people that are at most risk because of the known birth defect effects of PCP are young women of childbearing age. If you calculate that for the, for the city of East Chicago, that's approximately 6,000. Uh, not all of these women are going to get pregnant. But there is a risk. And I think we want to reduce or eliminate that risk. And therefore, I am very much in favor of saying no to this program. Thank you. I am Tara Adams. I am, um, as you said, a parent, a member of the community strategy group, as well as the CAG. Um, most importantly, I am a lifelong resident of East Chicago, um, who was just living in West Calumet, so I was one of the ones that was displaced. Um, going to what uh, Ms. Orange was saying about taking children out, I have a child and I'm trying to keep it in East Chicago school system, but Due to the contaminations that's out here, I don't see that happening. Um, because, first of all, we know that there's four schools. I don't know what school that they, it is. And if you're talking about putting more chemicals behind Central, 
then I'm not going to keep my child here. I am not going to keep her in a place where I know that she could become ill later or even sooner. I have a grandson that we just, I say I signed him up, but I know I couldn't do it on my own without his mom. He is three. I just signed him up for the pre-K center. I told my daughter when I found out about this, I said, look, we're going to need to get some money together and maybe send him somewhere else mm -hmm. because I'm not going to risk my family, biological family right. or the family that I have accum accumulated over the past 40 plus years of right. my life here right. in East Chicago. Right. So what I am willing to do is fight. Mm -hmm. right. I am a fighter and that's yes. what I do. Mm -hmm. I like what we need to do to get this to stop, but we, need to, we don't need to sit down. We need to be active in our own existence. Amen. So we need to fight and we need to come together as a community and let them know that this will not happen oh here without us being on that front line saying no and just letting, you know, lately, let me tell you, I, just, I gotta go because, you know, time, I, I get a little emotional because I love my people. Mm -hmm. You understand that? Mm -hmm. And we need to come together because we, as a group, can make things happen. That's right. Yeah. I mean, according to the word of God, it says, uh, one can make a thousand sleep, right. but what can what, what can all of us? If, if I can do it by myself, that's that's one. A ten, you know, we get the count. We can make a we can make a whole bunch of noise and a whole bunch of things right. happen around here. Yes. So yes. I say, let's come together. Mm -hmm. Let's continue to fight and let's say no that's right. to this permit. That's right. No that's right. to all the. Right. To the That, that will be detrimental. My mom right now is 65 and she's on oxygen for the rest of her life, been here since 1955. No to that. That's right. No, we want to live. That's right. Amen. We are not disposable Amen. and our families love us. Okay, so National Nurses United. I guess I'm the one that's going to wrap up the panel. Yes. Uh, my name is Sheila Garland. Um, and there's an H on the end of Sheila. Uh, oh, <laughs> Sheila. I know. You've known me oh, long Oh, Sheila. <laughs> I was thinking about the other Sheila. <laughs> so um, I am with National Nurses United. We represent over 200,000 registered nurses across the country. We represent a number of nurses that live right here in Indiana, some that live in Hammond and in the East Chicago Calumet um, area. Um, I'm here um, also as a member, a board member of the Southeast Side Environmental Task Force. I'm also um, a member of the uh, South, uh, Southeast Side Chicago Coalition of Van Petco. Um, and so that tells you that National Nurses United has a real commitment to and has been working on issues of environmental injustice across this country. We've been involved in DePaul. We're involved in fights across from Florida to California because that's where our members are. And so people may ask, why are nurses on the front line of environmental justice fights across this country? Because it is a health care issue that's right, that yeah. nurses have to deal with every day at the bedside. That's We're right. the ones that take care of, the, of your family, of your family members, when your family member has a miscarriage, That's right. when your child is born with a birth defect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're the ones that give you counseling and assistance and education to help you to take care of that, of that family member. So I'm here today representing National Nurses United specifically because I want to send a message to not only the congressmen, mm -hmm. but to the EPA administrators mm -hmm. that we have to say no That's to, right. the, to the permitting no. of PCB in this community. We've been involved working with the community around the lead issue, and it is absolutely unconscionable that anyone who administers programs to protect us would consider dumping even more toxins on a community that is already overburdened. All right. It is too much. too much. I'm also from Flint, Michigan. I grew up in Flint, Michigan. My parents were refugees from the South. So I understand the immigrant story. We have a lot of ties that bind us in this community that, in, that really says to us that we have to stand up and say no. I want to say one final thing. I was just recently traveling in uh, Latin America. I was in Honduras. And a lot of people have uh, sort of an understanding that, that the governments of these countries are uh, widely and perhaps cynically not responsive to the people that live in their countries. 
You know, that's kind of the general attitude that people have when you talk about a developing or a third world country, that they really don't have the wherewithal or the understanding or the capacity or whatever to take care of the population properly. And in fact, we did see encroachment of largely U.S. corporations and our U.S. government in Honduras uh, really uh, encroaching on sacred ground of the indigenous people that live in this country. I consider us to be the indigenous people of this area. We are in a fight for our lives as well. We're in a fight for the health of, of the people who live in this city. And I say no to, this, to, to, to the congressman here. We're asking you not to support the permitting of this uh, permit to dump even more toxins in this area. We boldly ask you to stand with us, mm -hmm. with oh this community, God. with the people of this area, in Hollywood region. It is time to take into consideration of us, the people, into consideration, rather than the needs of the corporations oh that want to dump on us, oh kill God. us, and poison us. Oh when we see as nurses, <clears throat> you know, birth defects, cancer, things that could be avoided because of what's in our environment, we ask you to please. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you. Yeah, so let's give our, our panel a hand, and we have a letter. We have, received, we have received support from a number of organizations across the state, the state NAACP, the Lawyers Guild, the Northwest Indiana Federation of Interfaith Organizations, the Community Strategy Group, the Management National Nurses United, the City Council of East Chicago, the East Chicago Waterway Management District, just to name a few. Just to name a few. Just to name a few. And we are so pleased to be able to announce support from a national faith-based organization mm -hmm. this morning. And Pastor Soroki is going to share that with us. Hello, my name is Reverend Marie Soroki. I am a board certified chaplain. I was born in beautiful Gary, Indiana. I am a member of the United Church of Christ, also part of their board of environmental justice, which is part of the Justice and Witness Ministries. And I have a letter here from Reverend Burks Burnt, who is the Executive Minister for Environmental Justice. The environmental justice movement was launched in the 80s in response to the placement of a landfill for PCBs near a predominantly black community in Warren County, North Carolina. The placement of this landfill ultimately led to a six-week civil disobedience campaign and the landmark publication of the Toxic Waste and Race Report that detailed the existence of environmental racism and the placement of toxic waste facilities throughout the United States. As the Environmental Justice Minister for the United Church of Christ, I worked for the organization that published this report and played a central role in organizing the civil disobedience campaign. Due to my intimate familiarity with the history of environmental racism and the disposal of PCBs, I was greatly disheartened and outraged to learn of the plans to dump PCBs at the confined disposal facility in East Chicago and thereby add to disproportionate burdens already shouldered by this community in which the minority of residents are people of color. In light of this, I add my voice to those voices from East Chicago who are demanding the denial of the draft permits as they call for this project to be stopped until all concerns are adequately addressed. Sincerely, Reverend Brooks Burnt, Minister for Environmental Justice. I do want to add, and Reverend Viscosi, this is not new to you because in the 80s you were also, the term environmental racism was coined and you were also writing resolutions and in Congress at that time. This continues. As a board certified chaplain, I echo what Sheila and what others have said. I see children in here. I see people in walk with walkers. I see people in wheelchairs. I minister to those of all faiths. We know the statistics. Those are the ones we know about. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. many women have had miscarriage? We have no idea. How many keep that silent? So right now, we have to demand to stop this. This community, for over a year, has been telling their stories, their pain, their experiences, and we're still talking. I'm not a resident, and I'm tired of it. But you live here. We're, and now you want to dump more toxins? No way. As no a chaplain, way. No way. we right. need to stop no the physical, that's going to be physical, tangible, so we can stop. We can stop the dumping. And only then can we get to the moral, to the moral trauma injury that our residents and our community have sustained, and it's environmental racism, and it has to stop. We need to address the needs of this community emotionally and spiritually. But right now, 
You have the power to do something physically. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. come to the point in the meeting because we have done this presentation for you. We know that you have had a vested interest in uh, the CDF. All we want today, all we want today is that you will support us in writing a letter and saying now that you object to the PCB permit that talks to permit in East Chicago. That's all we need. That's all we, oh, we don't need to hear anything else. <laughs> yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. On my block, I live on 4303 Homeland. In the last four years, there have been four people that died with cancer. One of them was my husband. All right. One of them was my husband. Mm -hmm. And we're, I'm tired of it. They tried to put us up there 20 years ago, right there on, on Goslin, and we fought it. Yes. And there's one lady, she had breast, breast cancer, and she has two small kids. And that's right on just one block on Homely, 4300. And we have been hearing And that. now we're starting to you wonder, the my daughter's been telling me, check into all of this and see if this has something to do with my husband's death. So our community is sick and tired, and you lost your wife? I lost my wife, she's been a teacher for 42 years in East Chicago. Okay. I stayed next door to Westside Junior High, which is now Moon Carey God. I've been there for 38 years. Uh, my daughter also had breast cancer, and uh, uh, six months after my wife had uh, passed, my daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer. So last year was a tough year for me. I'm still staying uh, by um, Westside and the new Cary guys, mm -hmm. but it gets hard to, um, I, I really don't understand why mm -hmm. they continue on doing what they're doing to this community. Uh, not only just myself, there's many other people Absolutely. that have been affected by cancer. Absolutely. And uh, thank God my daughter's doing a little bit better because she's in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. But we really do need someone to step up and help us out in this area because I've been here all my life and I've never seen a community more diverse, but yet we are still being thought as a poverty area mm -hmm. that we've been dumped on, toxic and empty. You look at the room today and the diversity in the room, right. it is, it's, it's a matter about human lives. It it's about human lives. And yeah. I'm t uh, as the young lady right there said, I don't know if they have done a study. I stay on 140 or 607 of the, that little area of how many people have died of cancer. And, but we just need your help. We really need your help. So, uh, we need to hear from you. Uh, we need to hear from you. Okay. Yes or no? Uh, we realize the time is of the essence. Because you said you have to leave at 11. Okay? And Reverend, I appreciate the courtesy. I would assume that uh, Mr. Lopez can text ahead and uh, tell people it would be about 20 minutes late. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would, I can answer your question directly. What I would also suggest, if you don't mind, because it's not my program. I would it, like the question answered directly the answer first. Is no. Or the answer no. is no? No, that I will not sign a letter saying I am opposed to the permit. Why? 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 Why don't you go to Griffith and ask the Griffith people to build this stuff and see how fast they throw you out? Okay, let me shut up. If I could, and I would like to take a few minutes of your time to explain my answer so you know where I am. Mm -hmm. One of the things before I begin, I would ask. And again, it's not my form. If there are others in the room who would like to say something at this point in time, I, was I would like. To I think that people came here to hear from you. People yes. have been talking about this. We've been hearing about people dying. So, happy, yeah, so let's hear from you. Okay. The and are thing, people willing to stay a few extra minutes? And I know you have another meeting. Fifteen. That yes. meeting is not until noon. Are people willing to stay another yeah. 15 or 20 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. We want to hear what you okay. say. All right. They need to hear from Colleen. Oh, right. Not for 15 or 20 minutes, or we'll give you 10 minutes, or because we have somebody else in here. Okay, well, yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard, that's a hard stuff. Uh, 
let me begin by thanking everybody here. For some of you, uh, it might be the first meeting of this type you have ever attended. For Colleen, it is not. And I would suggest for all of the problems we face, because I live in Gary, I was born in Gary, I represent every person in this room across Northwest Indiana. I am convinced for all of the problems we face today in East Chicago, in West Calumet, in this neighborhood, we have won, made progress over the last generation. And I would also suggest that your voice is being heard and you are being effective. Think about how many times the governor of the state of Indiana has visited the city of East Chicago this year. And we have Senator Randolph here, we have Senator Melton, we have Representative Harris, they are doggedly pushing the state every day on economic issues, on environmental issues. When was the last time an EPA administrator of either party has visited East Chicago, Indiana. With also both United States Senators <coughs> of both parties. You have captured people's attention and you are being effective. I would suggest to you I have spent not only my entire life in congressional office, but as a member of the congressional staff working to clean up Northwest Indiana. The only thing I would disagree with that has been said today is with my good friend, Senator Randolph. <laughs> he mentioned about 30 years, and I know what he meant, and I'm not disagreeing with that. We're dealing with a century-long environmental legacy that we have got to clean. <clears throat> I have two fundamental responsibilities the citizens' health and safety in the first congressional district in this nation and to make sure people have a good job for themselves and their family. That's it. Everything else is second. I have a list, and I'm not because I'm under a time constraint, but I'm happy to leave this. A list of environmental projects I have worked on all of my life, including the American uh, Chemical Service in Griffith, in Gary, uh, Lake Sandy Joe, 9th Avenue Dump, Midco, Midco 2, Gary Landfill, U.S. Smelter, Town of Pines in Pines, we have a project in Westville. Many of these are now and it never should have taken this long, are completed. Never on one of these very serious Superfund sites, each one of these is a Superfund site, did I ever take a specific position as to exactly what should be done or not done, or what approach should be taken. I agree with a lot of what has been said. One of the things Tom said is that we ought to have an environmental dredging. I wish we could, Tom. I wish there was federal authority to do it. I wish we had an administration that wasn't trying to cut the Environmental Protection Agency by $2.8 billion as we meet. And we're going to try to turn that back next week in the Appropriations Committee on which I serve. I would also agree with Tom that I would hope that there is someday sooner rather than later, not just for everyone in East Chicago and Northwest Indiana, but across the world, a permanent solution to PCP, as well as many of these other policies. So, Congressman, why, how come you don't want to sign this? I'll answer that to by make saying it that my responsibility is to make sure, and Sam suggested he's not a scientist, I'm an accounting major, is that those who have the expertise to make these decisions, have the resources they need, and that they abide by the letter and uh, the rule of the law. The fact that they have come back in for this amended uh, permit is an indication they know that this is a separate situation from the original dredging, and that they have to get permission. I would also suggest that despite the fact that the comment period has been closed, 
If there are others, including organizations, that will still want their position on record to make sure that I am, as well as EPA, knows what your position is and what your concerns are, we would want to share those with the agencies so they have as much possible information as they can have. Because I would also point out, as was mentioned by Larry, this is a witch's brew in the ship canal. To do nothing is wrong, too. What I want EPA and IDEM to decide is what is the best and safest approach. One of the things I would say Go somewhere else. Go somewhere else. No permit. 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 Michigan, and I'm tired of politicians yeah. running around you the block before they stand with the people that elect you. This is unconscionable. This is insulting to us. Yeah. What you're doing. We've heard the program. We want you to stand with us. We elected you to represent us. We're telling you this is what we need you to do. How difficult is that to understand? Now, now we know people. how to vote. Protecting the people <laughs> is the number one priority. That's the number one priority. The health of the people. You're hearing about folks in He doesn't care. It anymore. is about the lives this is of the ridiculous. people in this community. Wherever you live, you don't live next to a toxic waste thing. And if that is converted, this community has to live with that forever. It will never be anything but a 162 acre toxic, hazardous waste dump. Would you live next to it? And if you say yes, sell your house wherever you live, and you come live next to it. <laughs> Colleen Aguirre. Yeah, this, this will create the largest PCB dump on the Great Lakes. Okay? We are this, this, this CDF does not meet the siting, design, construction, and operational requirements of the law or the regulations. The only way they could permit it was through this risk based permit, which we've shown you is based on. A mis at best, a deceptive and misleading scheme using mothballs. Okay? Now, the red, I, I just one other thing here, okay? So I'm going to predict the future here, okay? 
The Reverend was nice enough to mention the Warren County PCB site. Okay, what took place there? Okay, just like the Indiana Harbor CDF, the Warren County, North Carolina PCW was poor on people suffered by the government. It received untreated docks in the PCB Incredible. way. It was the strikingly computer. opposed by the community. It was heavily criticized by experts as unsafe. And it began leaking toxic dioxins and PCBs almost immediately. Within two to four months, they had studies showing that it was a half a mile away from that landfill. What's a half mile away from this? School. 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 Right. School. Right. Third of a mile. Less than a half a mile. Okay. So what ultimately happened in 2001, the state, the government, was finally forced to detoxify the Warren County PCD dump at the tune of another $18 million in cleanup costs, which could have took place in the first place. Okay. All That's right. what we're seeing here. The other and if you allow the information to go through, it will never pass. Are those we're not leaving off this day. Oh, we to hear from Ms. Colleen Aguirre, who is a pioneer who has fought this fight. Let's give her a hand and let's give her a Uh. I'm going to tell you this. The EPA makes more money than God. Mm -hmm. Congressman, the original congressman, going back to our Congress, were not paid any money. They were just there to to make sure that the, uh, that the average worker wasn't making more money than the congressman. Now, you people make more money than God. I will tell you what. You people make more money. You people get to go to a VA hospital ahead of our veterans with your family, and our veterans are dying in the hospital waiting to get there. Yes. We have given up our rights. I am the most American person you will ever meet, <laughs> and I want you to listen to what I have to say. You are giving up your rights. You are doing it, and we are losing it because we are not united. I'll tell you what, I had five of the most fantastic entities in my life that made me the American I am. My mother, a young man, when I was in high, when I was in uh, the same grade, Johnny Rodriguez, his father came home from work one day, shot and killed his mother, shot and killed eight of his brothers and sisters, and wounded him, and when he and one brother left, lived. He had post-traumatic stress syndrome before he was ever had his dad uh, The next one was um, uh, the night that I had was my, my husband's family. And I had to earn my way into that. When I married my husband, my, my mother-in-law came to my wedding in black. Thank God my daughter was born, born first because she, you wouldn't have needed a DNA test. She had the black hair, the dark skin, because he was a baby, he was a Mexican heritage. Then, when my first one born son, when my first son was born, I kept sending him back to the nursery. The doctor said, Colleen, why are you doing that? I said, because he's too white. He said, you see that bread, that blue bracelet? I put it there. And I said, are you sure? Well, thank God I took him home. He looks like my side of the family. <laughs> the next one, so I was born with my second son, and he was a combination of both of us. Okay, and then last but not least, my, my last entity that made me the American I am was Martin Luther King and his wife, Coretta King. And believe me when I tell you this, Jesse Jackson was not at the head of the interest. I was with him and, and uh, his wife, Coretta King. They didn't like him, they didn't trust him, and she didn't like him at all. <laughs> And um, we would not have been, uh, but, but and then Martin Luther King said to me, Colleen, Colleen, what is your heritage? And I said, well, we were probably at all the time longer than any of them, because they, they were rum runners in Scotland, and they were rum runners when they got here. And he laughed, and he said, well, be proud of your heritage, Colleen, but remember this, be more proud that you are an American. And if Martin Luther King would have lived longer, there would have been no NAACP or anything else. There would have been well, something like the OAAP, the Organization for All American People. Because he said, be more proud that you are American. But we are self-segregating. I, I got a letter from a lady that wanted me to sign a petition, Black Lives Matter. I thought, oh, you want better. All Lives Matter. Too. Poor people's campaign. That's what we would have had. Exactly. 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 Exactly.
Yeah. And we need to sit down and talk about what to do. Yeah. That's a whole other day. I have okay. something because you know what? You need to try to fix this problem. My husband, yes, my husband died. He had two brain cancers. I mean, two, two surgeries in the brain that he was really hurt by. And he wanted to stay here in Chicago. He was born and raised in Mexico. And he, his, his mother brought him here. His mother died of cancer. She lived in Chicago since 1968. And she died and she never spoke or drank and she died. And you know what? We're tired of people getting cancer. I should have looked into it. I should have listened to my daughter and had her tested. And now our, my neighbors should have them tested. I got a, a neighbor, she had cancer. She should get tested and find out. And then come to you and probably try to come to sue you and see how it feels. If you know can, what? Have, you don't care. Don't you don't care. Them. You don't I, care. I, I, we, I bought a building, a dump care. right there on Guthrie. We just moved in that neighborhood and I, we went to the meeting. We fought it because we didn't want it. Yeah. Why don't you guys go to Griffith or Munster and see how fast they'll throw you out? Sorry for your loss and I will do my best. Hey. Tell us what it is you had. I wanted you to make sure it's Tell us what you had, Governor. Congressman? Tell us what you had, Congressman. Tell us what you had, Congressman. Yeah. Hey, good card. meeting, Thomas.